God's beloved church is being blessed today with his holy fire and joy along the way. She's gladly getting ready to meet him on the cloud, proclaiming his salvation with her voice so loud. Oh, don't you want to be a part of his son's bride? Come now and stand by his precious side. God's beloved church. God's beloved church. God's beloved church. consider that God loves his church, but he does. He loves us. We're his church. Everybody that belongs to Jesus, everybody that's washed in the blood of the Lamb is his church. And we're beloved to him. When he looks down on this earth, he sees a beloved people. And what does he see? He sees the blood of Christ on their lives. And he wants you to know, hallelujah today, if you've got his blood on your life that you are beloved to him glory to God we know that the Jews are God's chosen people but we know that we are his bride we are Jesus's bride so let's uh, worship the Lord today just as if there's just nothing going wrong <laughs> you know I'm sure there's things going wrong in everybody's life there are they happen but just worship him just like there's nothing, nothing at all besides him and you. Praise the Lord. Does somebody have a prayer request this morning? Pray for Sister mm -hmm. Lee. Yes, yeah, Sister Lee is sick. She's not here this morning because she doesn't she's feel well. She's going to try to make it for church. She is? Okay. She'll try to make it church time. But we'll pray for her between now and then. Okay, somebody else. Continue praying Jesus. for my brother. It's, yes. He had a surgery the other day and it went well. Oh, good. <laughs> Did he wake up? Uh, I, I, I'm not 100 percent sure about that yet. But okay. He still has the numbness or not? Yes. But they actually said they had him up yesterday, mm -hmm. walking around. Oh, good. Because he has to. Hallelujah. I guess he can't just be you know, on bed rest because no. I guess after the surgery you can get blood clots and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But uh, the surgery went good. And, okay. You know, things looking as good as it can. Remember be. Ralph that God will completely yes, heal him. Plan. Save him to the uttermost, right? Yeah. Somebody else. Thank you, Jesus. Excuse me. Continue to pray for, pray for Christopher. Um, I texted him a little bit. Yeah. And kind of going in slow. Yeah. And um, we'll see what happens. All right. Praise the Lord. Gloria? Um, pray for my friend Bailey's. I think it's her grandma's um her foot because when her great grandma was really little she wore shoes that were way too small and now her oh. okay um praise the lord i thought of something remember sister rita i'm not sure if she'll get to come this morning i hope they do but um, 
Pray for her that God will continue to heal her, completely heal her. Pray for their family and pray for Hannah that God will help her with the baby. Anybody else? Somebody else. Um, Chris, Chris and Bill as we're wrapping everything up in the next couple of weeks um, with all of our events and graduating and all that. Just pray for us that it will go well. Amen. Hallelujah. Somebody else? Thank you, Jesus. <coughs> Remember, all of the, all the children and families in the church, you know, your girls and your boys and the whole, all the families, because Sister Netta's family, praise the Lord, my brother and sisters, Michael's brothers and sisters, we want to see them all saved before the Lord comes. I mean, really saved, so it takes prayer to pray for them. Pray for all the people on Facebook and YouTube, all the people that are watching us. Remember Brother Henson? Is he doing any better? Hands? How's his hands? We pray for him. About the same. Let's keep praying for his hands that God will heal them so he, it doesn't hurt him so bad to work. Pray for him. Anything else? Okay. When I was in uh, Baltimore, I got a chance to talk to a lot of people about the Lord and what we're doing. And mm -hmm. I gave out a lot of our cards. So just pray for all the people that I Interacting with Amen. You're watching this morning. There he is. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And good morning, Brother Joe. <laughs> I'm hoping he's looking watching this morning. I saw him at the funeral and I asked him, did he watch us? And you know, he's so busy getting, but just pray for him that God would help him. He's most of the dispensation of the property they have and everything they have is on his shoulders and he really needs the Lord to help him so pray for Joe, Brother Joe Grantland. Anything else? So remember you already said pray for my family, really pray for my sister Pam, okay. we'll just really help her and then um, pray for Jose's grandpa he had an incident to where he had to go to the hospital he's out but just pray that the Lord just heal his body okay, heal grandpa's body Anything else? Praise the Lord. Okay, let's go to prayer and let's believe the Lord while we pray. Oh, help Angela 
salvation this morning. Sister Angela, Brother Jason, help them, Lord, today. Oh, God, we praise you and thank you, Lord. Ask you to help Sherry wherever she is right now. Help her, Lord. Oh, help all of Ann's children, grandchildren, Lord. Help them, Lord. Oh, help all of Sister Henson's children, grandchildren. Help them, Lord. Help them this morning, God. Well, Amon, do I need it, Amon? We praise you and thank you. Help Brother Henson heal his hands, Lord. Let him feel the healing virtue flowing through his hands, Lord. Help him, Jesus. Help all those people that Brother God ministered to in their Maryland, Lord. Help them. Help them, Lord. Help each one. Help Jim, Lord, this morning. Help Jim Turner, God. Help him, Lord. We love him and ask you to help him. Oh, praise your wonderful name. Help you, Jesus. Help John Sachs this morning. Help you, Lord. We praise you and ask you to help him, Lord, in Jesus' name. Oh, Father, we pray for your power, Lord God, in every way, in everything, Jesus. Help him, Lord. Help us, Father. Help us, Father. Help, Lord God. Hallelujah. Help us, Father. Praise the Lord. Heal these body, Lord, for your glory. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers. Thank you for helping us to have faith in you for everything. Bless everybody on Facebook and YouTube, Lord, all their needs. People that are real sick, Lord, heal them this morning. Let them feel the healing virtue passing through, God. Here's no distance in prayer. Let them feel that anointing, Lord, deliver them. Jesus, the anointing of your stripes, deliver them from the sicknesses. We claim liberty in Jesus' name. Praise your Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Hey, children, let's go to Sunday school. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. to give you guys and we'll try to post the images online after the Sunday school um, for what those are but give you a good I want to give you a good visual of how the tabernacle was set up created manufactured boxed up stored transported right? and last week we talked went through kind of a history but we talked about how um, God gave instructions for Moses to have this this thing built. And um, why? Why do you want him to build it? What was the purpose? To worship him. Right. Because, I mean, up until this point, there was no place for them to see God or to, to have any visual recognition of Him. Now when we drive around and we see a church, we think of God, right? I mean, even if it's church in a town that we're not familiar with, we go, oh, look, there's a church. I mean, we associate that building with the Lord to some degrees. And they're out in the middle of the desert. Yeah. So there was no happenstance church that they're going to go through and find in some pagan country? No, that's not going to happen, right? It's the middle of the desert. It's not, there's nothing out there. And God, in the travels, if you follow the Exodus and how they routed around, they intentionally went around all of the major cities 
Because God didn't want to put them in conflict with a bunch of people right away. Right? He needed them to get stronger and more unified and more understanding. So it was, it was his house. It was his abode. It was a way for him to be with the people as they were traveling everywhere. If you've ever been to Europe, um, the cities in Europe, the church will be like in the center of the town. And then all of the streets will radiate out from the center of the town. It makes almost like a hub and a spoke on a wheel, okay? And the, and the intent is that from any place in the city, as you're walking down the street, you can look down the street, and there's the church. And if I'm walking down this other street, there's the church. It was intentional. And they set up the tabernacle the same way. The tabernacle was placed in the middle of the camp where everybody knew where it was, and then all of the tents went out and were um, set up around it by families, by the 12 families or tribes of Judah, okay, by the tribes of Israel. Um, look, at, um, look at Exodus 33. <clears throat> I want you to understand the intention that God has with this we'll say building but it was a structure this tabernacle 33 and 14 and he said my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest and he said unto him if thy presence go not with me carry us not up hence for wherein it shall be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight. Is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And then right after this is when Moses asks him, can I see your glory? Right? I mean, he says, okay, well, you said you're going to be with me forever. Can I see you? He's just itching. The very next verse, he asks him, can I see your glory, please? Right? Moses is desiring God to be with him and the people. So that, so that people will know that the people have found grace in thy sight. Right? It's not going to be like, well, I think maybe God's paying attention. No, he's in that thing right over there. All the time. Wherever we go, there he is. Whatever street I'm on, I can see the church. Right? Whatever tent I'm in, I can see the tabernacle. The tabernacle is a big structure. We're going to go out in the yard at some point, and we'll show you. I mapped it out in the yard here, how big the tabernacle was. We actually measured it out in the yard with the kids when I did this the other time. So, so I know. And, and when you see it in your mind visually, the size of it, not huge, but good-sized. Good-sized. What he's saying is, and Moses is really saying, I want you to intercede for us all the time. I want you to be right there for us all the time. And they say, you know, God, if you dwell with us, it would certainly help me to lead these people. If they know that it's not just me and that you're right there, it's going to help me lead these people. The construction of the tabernacle also reflected a lot of um, heavenly things. Turn to Hebrews. The, the descriptions and, and elements and features of the tabernacle are found throughout the Bible. Um, sorry, I'm having trouble finding. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 8. And verse 5 says, Who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle 
For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. We read where in Exodus he said that. Look at 9 and 9. It says, which was a figure for the time then present, which was then offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances immediately imposed on him until the time of reformation. So, so the temple and the tabernacle and all of those things were elements to help us with that time of service, right? To, to do the ordinances that were imposed upon them through the law of Moses until the Reformation. So what is the Reformation? What is the reforming of everything? Because in the past, in the Old Testament, they had to, if they sinned, what they had to do? They had to get an animal, they had to take it, they had to clean it, they had to take it to the priest, right? The priest had put it on the altar, or killed it, and put it on the altar, burned it, or did whatever thing, whatever type of sacrifice was needed for that thing. But then everything changed. We don't do that anymore. What changed? Jesus. Jesus Christ. His sacrifice on the cross is the point of reformation of the church. We were reformed. We didn't have to follow those rules specific to the sacrifices because he made the sacrifice once and for all. Right? Um, look at verse 23 in chapter 9. <clears throat> it was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And in verse 10 and 1, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. So even if, even if they took the goat or the bullock or the whatever and gave it to the priest and they did that, okay, they would leave and then they didn't have a change of heart because you know why? There was nothing in there. They didn't give their heart to God. They atoned for their sacrifices through the priest, through the, the committing or the enacting of the law of sacrifices, but it didn't really change this, right? The Reformation changed our hearts. When we sinned and we were um, sorry for our sins and we asked God for forgiveness for our sins, he, he, allows us, he allows that stony heart to become a heart of flesh. He lets it heal. He lets it mend. And you know what? He lives in there. That's the difference. Jesus didn't live in those people back then. He resided in the most holy place of the tabernacle, and that was where he lived. He influenced them, right? He helped them. He guided them. <clears throat> we'll talk about tonight, but... In the beginning, he didn't even talk to them. He talked to Abraham, and he talked to some other people audibly, right? He talked to Noah. He talked to different people. But then he talked through the prophets, right? And then instead of doing that, he talked through Jesus right into our hearts, right? He came in and lived with us and would tell us things directly, continually. But this whole thing was... Christ, Christ talked about his body as being the temple. Right? He spoke of the church as the body of Christ. Things that God created in his image. The tabernacle reflects Christ and the church. It's an image or a representation or a remembrance of Christ and the church. If you pull nothing else away from the weeks and weeks we're going to talk about the tabernacle, I want you to understand that. It is a reflection, a symbolic representation of Christ and the church.
And at some point, we leave this earthly tabernacle. Right? We take away this corruptible. And we put on incorruption. We end up in the heavenly places. The heavenly tabernacles. The heavenly buildings of God. Um, look at Ephesians chapter 5. I think I might have just quoted that. <clears throat> Brother Don, I have a question. Yeah. If the Jews don't believe that Jesus was their Messiah and their sacrifice, and they, they still don't do animal sacrifices, what do they do now for their sins? Currently, um, to, like today. They, I, I think they still do some of that. Um, they, they, you know, the unleavened bread and some of the other things. They still do follow the Mosaic law, and the and the very devout Jews will follow right. all of it. They will still sacrifice him. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. Because you don't hear about that. You don't hear about it much. Um, I, I don't know that a lot of them in this country do that. I don't know, to be honest. That's a good thought. I have to look that up. I'll try to have an answer next week. Uh, where was I? Ephesians. Ephesians 5 and verse 23. I can't get to it. Galatians. Ah. Yay. 5 and 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the Savior of the body. Christ is the Savior of the body, the head of the church. <clears throat> so the tabernacle is this representation to Christ and the church. It's also a map. It's a map or a, of the path to salvation and reconciliation with God. And we're, we're going to follow that path as we go through the areas and study the areas of the tabernacle. But as you go through, you go in and you're on your, first you're on the outside, right? Then you go through the first gate and you're in the court. And then there's certain things there. And then once you accomplish those things, then you can go to the next little inner court, right? And then if you get to the next point and you get real close to God, then you get into the most holy place. So it's a pathway. It's a pathway of how to get there. It's a reputation. And it's a guide to resolve all of the brokenness Last week I talked about and gave you examples of all the places where the people broke away from God, right? Where we did things that were just not really nice, right? We weren't very respectful. We didn't honor God the way that we should. These people in the Bible, the examples I read through. And it was a great separation from God from the time of the creation when Adam and Eve, they were like buddy-buddy, right? Until... The Exodus, where they're wandering around in the desert, those people had no idea. No idea. Because they've been, what, 400 years they've been slaves? They didn't know anything. So it was a guide to resolve the brokenness, the disconnection that they had from God. Because now God was going to live with them. He was in their neighborhood. He was right down the street. It's a whole different thing than a God afar off, right? And God himself resided in the section where only the priest could go, but there was a path provided. There were sacrifices offered. There was cleansing available through the path, right? Through the labor, through the altar of incense. And the whole goal of that was to permit our bonding, that reattachment, right? To resolve that separation that we've gotten from God. And when we sin, when we do a terrible thing and it happens, we are disconnected from God because God cannot tolerate sin. But when we reconcile with God, right? And this is going to show us the map of how we do that then we reconcile with God, we can reconnect back with Him, and it's like we never left. And you know what? He doesn't remember those bad things we do. We remember them a lot longer than He does. Right? 
He throws them in the sea of forgetfulness. But that, that outcome of that sinful act or acts separates us from God. And the temple is the map or the blueprint of how to get reconnected with God. That's why it's important. It represents Christ in the church. And how to realign and reassociate and reconnect those things that are broken. And as we're going to see as we read through the instructions that are given to Moses... Let's talk first about the creation event. Let's talk about Genesis 1 and 1 just for a minute. Did God say anything in the words that he gave to Moses to write about the creation of how he did it? Therein lies one of the problems with the world today because there's no specific detail. Well, how exactly did he create that? Did he just say it? Yes. That's what the Bible says, right? Well, what did he say? You know, he didn't, I mean, you know, there are people that say, I don't understand how he did it. Now, I'm of the people that say, I don't really need to understand how he did it. I'm just really glad that he did it, right? We wouldn't be here. But he was very vague, right? I said it. There it is. It was good. Done deal. Right? With the tabernacle, we're going to see he is very, very specific. He tells them every dimension, every material, every type of connector, every uh, picture or design on the drapes or tapestries, um, exactly where it goes, how it fits together, everything. How long the cord has to be, how long tall the poles have to be, how everything and it was for a reason it was for actually several reasons the first reason is that the tabernacle as i said is a foreshadowing of events it's that pathway to reconciliation to resolve our brokenness there are aspects of the tabernacle that are also new testament realities so even though the tabernacle was way back in the beginning of the old testament Right? There are things about that and the path to salvation that are absolutely relevant to the New Reformation, New Testament understanding. It's a picture. And, and there's a lot of different um, hypotheses about why they did something somewhere or another way. And I, I've tried through these notes to not um, throw a lot of weird interpretations. If, if there's one that sounds really weird, I might point it out and just tell you that it's really weird, and I don't know that I absolutely trust that that's what that means, because we don't really know. Um, there are some uh, commentaries that um, you know come up with their own little reasons of why they did it this way or that way, okay? And I'll try to make sure I note those as, you know, these are just what people think. This is not something that we proven out, right? Now some of it comes from other religious and Jewish scriptures and, and, and documentation from history and things like that. And I'll point those out. Historically, this is how it was done or something like that. Okay, as we go through this. Sometimes people come up with stories or, or ideas that just make things fit together when they don't really fit together. They might not really be rightly related, but they try to relate them anyway. Um, the second thing about the tabernacle was it was God's way to stress the importance of worship. I mean, if the people didn't have a specific place to reference to, if it wasn't that church down the street type of thing, then they wouldn't. He wanted to formalize it. Not just say, hey, I'm your God, you should worship me, right? Hey, I'm your God, there's the tabernacle, there's all the pathways to righteousness, you should worship me, right? It was an emphasis, it was a point of emphasis. And he wanted to make sure that whatever they did, it was right and proper. So he gave no details to the to the um, creation event when he built that, because the people didn't have anything to do with it. Right? There were no people till day six. 
So it didn't really matter what they thought. <laughs> they weren't there to listen anyway. But the tabernacle, this was something that the people built, right, under the direction of God. But then not only built, but would have to take down, put back up, take down, put back up many, many times, over hundreds, well, at least dozens, tens of years, okay, at least 40 that we know of. Um, we'll talk about where it went after they were out of the other, because it actually ends up in Shiloh at the time of Eli and Samuel. Um, so anyway, we'll talk about that. Um, but great details about every board, every fitting, every rope and cord, every garment, every instrument used in the sacrifices, the curtains, everything. Intricate detail. And, and the probable reason was that God knew that the people didn't have any clue how to build something like this. Yes. If it had the different layers of um, holiness and this and that, and only certain people could go within certain areas, how did they determine who put it up and who put it down, took it down? Um, only the priests were able to take it up and put it down. So the, the um, Mirrorites and the Gershonites could take it up, and they were responsible for the packing of the tabernacle. Na tabernacle. <laughs> and the putting it on the carts with the oxen and everything. So they enclosed the center to keep it holy. <clears throat> um, actually, the um, the ark had um, rods that goes through rings, and then they would lift it. Mm -hmm. They couldn't touch the ark, but they the could touch the staves, down. right? Yeah. Um, and then they would move it out, put it on its cart, and then they would take all the, the candelabra and the altar of incense and the table of showbread, and they disassemble them, they disassembled, and they would put them together, put them on their cart with the instruments. And then all the, the um, boards and the pillars around for the outside gate fence perimeter would be stacked on a cart or carts. I think there were 60 carts, if I remember. It's a lot of carts. <laughs> and... <clears throat> And the idea, and we'll see this, but the idea was that he designed it and he implemented it in a way that they could set that thing up wherever they ended up next and it would come out and it would look exactly the same. Right? And the materials were made such that they didn't um, or were easily replaced or updated. So if a piece of equipment or a piece of uh, the temple was showing its age or where they could get it replaced and replace just that one segment and just go on from there. Well, if you figure their clothes didn't wear out for four years. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Um, there, there is documentation that there were things that were replaced oh. in, over different times. Because things do wear out, especially with fire, right? I mean, you're burning stuff on the altar, those altars are going right. to diminish over time, right? Even if they're encased in gold and what have you. Um, The, the big thing, he, and he gave us that preciseness and all the detail so that the people would properly worship God. So they would learn from the beginning, this is how this works. This is the pathway. These are the elements that you need to understand. And because they did it every day, right? And the thing was sitting there every day, the people knew. All the people knew how this worked, right? It was a, it was a guide. It was a help, and, and it let them help to discover um, moral and judicial things, right? The reasonings behind everything. And it didn't leave anything to their imagination. I mean, they'd already proved in the desert that their imaginations come up with all kinds of wild stuff. Remember the molten calf with Aaron? I mean, how do they, how do they drain that up, right? From nothing. Oh, I just I threw the earrings there, and the calf came out. Sure it did, yeah. right? But it re reduced the risk of them messing it up by him giving them this intricate detail. And the detail also ensured that it displayed the best image of God's glory. Right? It was a beautiful structure. The materials that were used were only the choicest materials available. And remember, they're in the middle of nowhere. Right? You can't go down to Walmart and get a replacement 
peace, right? I mean, they had to deal with what was there. And what was there was not much. I mean, this was not a big forested area, right? This is a desert with maybe some, um, they call them algum trees or shittum trees. These are very small trees. These are not very large at all, right? So how do you get a 30-foot beam out of a 10-foot tree, right? So we'll talk about that when we get to the beams. So it's portable, it's design, it's transportation, the ability to take it down and reset it exactly the same wherever they went. Everything had to be perfect and, and something that could not be done incorrectly. Right? In my, in my region, which, which was the federal government, we call it kernel proof. Right? Even a kernel can use this thing. Right? And when everything was finished according to the pattern that was provided to Moses when he was in the mountain, Israel had something to show which would make an impression on anybody outside of their nation. Right? These other nations, they didn't have such a structure. They didn't have anything like that. I mean, that was special. That made them special. And it really provided an answer. If, if somebody from another nation came and said, well, where is your God? Right? The Israelites said, he's right over there. He's in that building right over there. That, see that big white thing? He's right in there. He lives in that tabernacle that was not created by man or the invention of art or anything but completely assembled by divine instruction. We didn't know how to build that thing. He told us how to do everything. And it points to Christ. It, it points to the importance of our worship to the glory of God. That was why it was there. So the direction and the blueprints were told to Moses in the mount. The materials were offered up by the people. And there were two men, there were chief artifactors that were established. It was Bezalel and Aholiab. And these two men were gifted by God to be able to build and construct literally anything. Do you know, your dad's one. Do you know anybody who can just build anything? Mm -hmm. Right? My dad was like that. My dad, when I was six years old, turned an old uh, dryer into a cotton candy machine for my sixth birthday party. That was my dad. He could take anything and turn it into anything. I wish I still had that machine. Um, <laughs> it took eight months of labor, and then the tabernacle with all of its um, structures and walls and golden fixtures and implements and everything, and it was erected on the first day of Nisan. Let's look at Exodus chapter 40. We start out earlier now. It's all the way to chapter 40 before it gets done. Um, chapter 40, verse 17. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on that first day of the month, that's the month Nisan, that the tabernacle was reared up. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened its sockets and set up the boards thereof and put in the bars thereof, and reared up his pillars. He spread aboard, abroad the tent over the tabernacle, and put on the covering of the tent above it, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he took and put the testimony into the ark, and set the staves on the ark, and put the ark, or put the mercy seat above upon the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, and set up the veil of the covering, and covered the ark of the testimony, as the Lord commanded Moses. And he put the table in the tent of the congregation upon the side of the tabernacle northward without the veil. And he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. Do we see a trend here? As the Lord had commanded Moses. This is not something Moses made up. This is not something Bezalel and Aholiab made up. This is something that they were directed to build. That they were given the blueprints to. And they didn't do anything else. Well, you know, don't you think that would look better in blue, right? You can hear somebody say it. No, it needs to be white. 
It needs to be purple. It needs to be, there were certain needs with the colors. You couldn't just color them anything you want. The cherubims had to look a certain way. The mercy seat had to be made a certain way. Everything had to be covered with silver material. Well, gold's very expensive. Why can't we cover those in silver instead? No, they're in the most holy place. They have to be covered with gold because gold is more pure than silver. There are reasons behind everything that happened because the Lord commanded Moses. He wanted it to be exactly this way. And they did it. Here, here in chapter 40, they... And then every time... Well, we'll talk about that. I'm not going to jump ahead. <clears throat> well, let's talk about the journeys. Because it is a portable structure. It was not something that was going to be built once and forgotten about. Right? It was something that they had to maintain. It was something that had to be moved. And if you've ever built a building, taken apart a building, and rebuilt a building, right? Things break when that happens. Right? It's very hard... When, when something's portable, I mean, when we started with, I don't have my phone, when we started with portable phones, right, the first portable phones, you could barely look at them and they would break, right? They're a little better now, right? They're a little more rugged. They got funny glass on them to keep it from cracking, maybe. Um, some people are still hard on them. They still don't last through the washing machine. But, you know, I'm not saying you did that. I was just, oh, her? She's, no. Brother Michael, that was his favorite, was washing in the washing machine. He had a note on the inside lid of his washing machine. Check for cell phone. <laughs> That's funny. He's funny. I think it might still be there. <laughs> it was a portable story. It was carried by the Kohathites and the Gershonites and the Merites. I forgot the Kohathites. Um, and the, the pillar of God. Let's talk about that. Um, when they went, there was a pillar of fire and a pillar of the cloud, right? So was there one pillar or two pillars? But one was cloud during the day. So where was the other one? If the fire one was only at night. So what if the what if the pillar of the cloud actually just got fiery? It says and, right? But but some people believe, and I'll just say it this way. Some people believe there's one pillar and it would change from a cloud and then it would change into fire at night and then it would turn back into a cloud in the day and a fire at night. So one pillar. Not two. I always thought there was two. And, and I, I don't know if I still believe that or not. I, I can't say for myself what I believe. But at the very least, there was at least one pillar. We can say it that way, right? But this pillar would show them where to go. And the pillar of God would define exactly where the ark and the mercy seat was to be placed. Okay, so the pillar would go along, right? When they were in a journey, the pillar would take off. And they go, ooh, take down the tabernacle. And they pack everything up. They get in their things, and they get their donkeys, and they get down the road. And then the pillar would be stopped somewhere. Wherever that pillar stopped, that's where they put the mercy seat and the Ark of the Covenant. And from there, the tabernacle would build out against it. And then from there, the people in the tents would surround it. When the pillar moved, everything was pulled up and hauled away. When it stopped, everything was reset in the new place. And it could stay there for a, a day, a month, a year, a thousand, whatever. They would hang out. As soon as the pillar goes, okay, blow the trumpet. Here we go. Load up the carts. Okay, let's go. It moves like five feet. Okay, don't get set everything back up, right? I don't think it was ever five feet, no, but no. <laughs> God's out there going. Huh, huh, huh. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the, the, the location of that tabernacle, right, which was defined by where the pillar of the cloud stopped, the location of that tabernacle, um, was sort of marked as the headquarters for the host of Israel, right? That was their command post, if you will. He was their commander in chief. When, when they do arrive in Canaan for, with Joshua, it accompanied Joshua on most of his expeditions against the other armies. Like they would bring the carts and stuff with them because he had the ark with him. Um, but in every case, it was taken down piece by piece, packed into the carts, and hauled away by the oxen. 
And in charge of that whole process were these designated priests. Nobody else. It would be erected at every stopping point. Now, the, the position of the tribes and their tents around the tabernacle is also prescribed and outlined by God. He says, okay, here is Dan and Naphtali, and here's Gath, and here's all of them. And there's, there's studies, and I don't have the, the, the paper with me, but if you take the amount of people that were in each tribe, and you look at how many people that would be, and where north, south, east, and west they were to be in orientation to the tabernacle, it makes a cross. It makes a cross. So there's little tiny tribes up here, there's great big tribes down here, right? And the medium tribes here and here. And, the, and when you add up all the people and you look at the sizes, and I've got a, I've got a picture, I'll bring it next week. I didn't print it out this week. I didn't, I didn't know we'd get this far. Um, it actually shows this as a cross. I mean, the cross thing didn't happen for thousands of years after this, right? But it does form a cross. Um, and, and the signal for the start and the stop was the pillar. Look at um, let's look at Exodus thirteen. Just flip back. This is where it talks about the pillar. Um, Exodus thirteen and verse twenty one. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them in the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. He took not away the pillar of the cloud by day, nor the pillar of the cloud of fire, pillar of fire by night from before the people. So don't really say pillars, right? And and it's the Lord went by them in a pillar of a cloud, and then by a pillar of fire. Could that be the same pillar? It could. It could. Anyway, that's where that was. Um, that pillar of the cloud is also sort of defining um, the presence of God. Remember later. Like when Moses was at Mount Sinai, right? The whole cloud was, or I'm sorry, the whole mountain was covered with a cloud with lightnings and thunderings, right? That was God's presence descended on the mountain, right? And it scared all the people down in the valley because they thought all that lightning and those clouds, you know, Moses is a goner, right? <laughs> Let's make a calf, you know. <laughs> so so they, they didn't understand what was going on, right? But um, but why why all this need for guidance? Why why did God have to like you know <laughs> grab him by the ear? <laughs> Come on this way. Okay, stop. Okay, this way. Okay, stop. It was a lot of it was for their protection, right? So I mean, because I thought Moses was supposed to lead the people. But did Moses know where he was going? No. It was the pillar of cloud or the fire that knew where they were going. Moses just, hey, look, the pillar's moving. Let's go. That was his, that was his directionally challenged self, right? And, and the alternate routes that they could have taken might have been shorter, but they could have encountered some big band of Egyptians or Ethiopians or some other tribes that would try to hurt them or whatever. So, you know, sometimes he God would just weave them around the different populations of other nations so that they would be left alone, right? They would have peace. You wouldn't have to fight in order to proceed. I mean, had they really had a battle up until this point? Not really. You could call Pharaoh's army the battle, but all they did was walk across the Red Sea and... God drowned everybody else. They didn't do anything. 
They didn't have a spear. They didn't know what to do with any of that. They didn't build their armies until much later. They, they weren't really prepared to fight in any battles. And, and the wilderness was a vast and a desolate place. It, it was largely uninhabited, right? There weren't a lot of concentrations of people in this wilderness. Where they, and without a good guide, they could be wandering for a long time and, and wandering into places that have no ability to sustain them. No water, no food, no shelter. They could easily perish in a place like that, especially for a long time, which they were there a long time. But God's continuous presence allowed them and enabled them to persevere on that journey all the way through. It was their visible evidence that God was with them. Even when the tabernacle was on the cards, well, where is your God? See that cloud right there? See that pillar of fire right there? That's it. He's right in there. Something they can point to. Similarly, God, as new Christians, sometimes we get thrown into a wilderness. I mean, we can be in places where it feels like nobody's around. Nobody's listening. Nobody's paying attention to me. Nobody cares about what I believe. They believe what all they believe. They don't understand why I do things that I do or why I don't do things that I do. They just want me to do the things that they do and I'm not comfortable with that anymore. It's a wilderness. It's a wilderness. But, where is your God? He's right here. I don't need a pillar of a cloud. I don't need a tabernacle because Jesus is in me. The Holy Ghost, the Comforter, is in me. He's right here. That's our assurance. That's our protection. Will, will God show you where to go? You bet. Will God show you what to do and how to do it? Yes. Yes, He will. So after they cross over Jordan, Joshua's got it. And he sets it up in um, Shiloh. Look at Joshua. Um, where did I find it? Joshua chapter 18. Joshua 18 and 1. And the whole congregation and the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. And the land was subdued before them. So Joshua sets this up in Shiloh, and it remains there all the way through until the time of the judges, even the time of Eli. Because remember, Eli was in Shiloh, and he was there with Samuel as a boy, Right? Because they said the lamp of God had gone out. Remember that story? Okay? Well, that lamp of God was the candelabra in the tabernacle. Right? And their job was to keep that lit at all times. But it, it didn't. It had gone out. So that was the place. Uh, then 1 Samuel 4 and 4. First Samuel 4 4. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from thence the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, which dwelleth between the cherubims. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And then, and then the Philistines hear all that and they're like, oh, they got the Ark of the Covenant. Whoa, woe unto us. <laughs> this is not good for our team. They've got the Ark of the Covenant. We're in trouble. But it was taken from that building. 
at that time and um, it never returned. If you remember the um, ark was taken and then when they tell Eli that the ark was taken he flops over dead breaks his neck. Part of that was um, God had told Samuel that, right? That your sons and yourself will die on the same day. And that's exactly what happened. Now, it's probable, or I'll say it this way, some speculate, how about that, that the ark may have deteriorated, because it was made of wood. <laughs> the wood was covered with gold, but it was still made of wood, and it was very old. So after many years, it would have been worn and decayed and that kind of thing. So they think it may be. But there are others that suggest that, there are other texts that suggest that it possibly could have been replaced with a model that was made from stone instead of from the wood. I don't know whether any of that's true. I'll just classify it that way. The Bible does not state any of this. This is just from other texts. Now, there are other elements of the tabernacle that were transferred. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 7. Just flip a page or two. Chapter 7 and verse 6. And they gathered together to Mizpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord and fasted on that day and said there... We have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. Um, where is it at? Okay. Oh, 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 I see what it is. And then Samuel says, cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us. He will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. And Sam took a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. So that altar that he did that on was in the tabernacle. Right? In Mizpah at this point. So at some point it moved. The whole Some of the other instruments were moved from Shiloh to Mizpah. Okay? Doesn't ever say in the Bible like where when they moved that, but but here we see that it's here now. Um, look at chapter nine, nine and verse twelve. And they answered him and said, "He is. Behold, he is before you. Make haste now, for he." came today to the city, for there is a sacrifice of the people today in the high place. That high place would be the tabernacle. right? But at this point, this is in the mountain when Saul was looking for the donkeys right, for his father's stuff. And he runs, and they're saying, you know, where, where would I find this Samuel guy? Right? The seer, they called him. And they said, oh, and then so then they, he told them that. And then chapter 10 Verse 3. Then thou shalt go forward from thence, and thou shalt come upon the plain of Tabor, and there shall be three men going up to God to Bethel, one carrying three kids, another three loaves of bread, another carrying a bottle of wine. So, those three bottles of wine, three loaves of bread, and the three goats, those are meant for sacrifice. So why would those men be taking them up to Bethel, right? To be sacrificed on the altar of God, right? For the atonement. So at this point now it's in Bethel. So so it did seem to move from place to place after they came out of across Jordan. Right? It was first in Mizpah, then Shiloh, right? Now it's in Bethel. Um, in David's day, remember he went 
to Nob, to Abiathar, and he, he said, Give, do you have the showbread? Right? And the showbread was part of the tabernacle. So, so at that point, the, the priests and the sons of the priests were in Nob, right? There were 80 of them that were slain by Doeg the Edomite. You remember that story? That's always a fun one to read to the kids. Yeah. Um, but there was stuff there, and David said, give us of the showbread so that we would have some to eat because we're hungry. Yeah, I'm hungry. I need to eat. So, so there were certain times where this thing moved after you know, the big time. Didn't move as frequently, obviously, right? Because everybody was kind of dispersed through the other regions, right? They were taking over that promised land. And even in the case of at the, the end of of David's reign as king, the high place that was at Gibeon possessed some fragments of the original tabernacle. And that part in, in First Chronicles and First Kings, where they talk about with David. That's really the last time we hear a lot about the specific articles about the tabernacle in the Bible. You know, there's brief mentions to it or reflections on it of what they did then, that kind of thing. But we'll go ahead and stop there. Um, and then we'll look at the um, sort of temporary quarters. There were some um, temporary places where the like the um, artifacts of the tabernacle were stored that were not the physical tabernacle. Right? There was a separate tent. And this was done mostly as they were preparing to build the temple. Because some of the things, not all, but some of the things they used in the tabernacle were used in the temple that Solomon built. Okay? But they didn't have a place, so they stored them in this sort of temporary place. Okay? So we'll talk about that. And then we're going to get into um, the, the construction of things. You know, specifically, we're going to start with the courtyard of the tabernacle. Okay? Good. Is this good so far? You guys like, liking this? Okay. I enjoyed doing it the first time and researching all this out. And um, I think.
Hallelujah. Feel that spirit of worship in here? Woo! Woo! <laughs> Hallelujah. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus.
your name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, it says it's going to be quiet in heaven for 30 minutes, right? <laughs> and then back it comes again. Woo! Hallelujah. It's going to be hard to be quiet where Jesus is. It's going to be hard to be quiet where God and all those angels are. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. You know, I feel help this morning. I don't know if you do, but I do. I feel help from above. Hallelujah. I'm going to read from 2 Timothy, the first chapter, in the seventh verse. Hallelujah. You want us to pray for you before we get on me? Come on. I'm going to pray for her. Thank you, Jesus. I've come to a long time. See the back? All right. Her back and everything else. Oh, Father, we anoint her with oil in the name of Jesus. Father, we felt your spirit here today. We ask you, Lord, that you would take please need into your mind. You said you supply all our need according to your riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And Lord, we pray for healing, Father. This need must be met. Will you meet it this morning, Lord? Heal her back. Heal her from everything that's troubling her, her stomach, Lord, every bit of it, Lord. Oh, Jesus, hallelujah. The enemy has tried to hold on to this sickness, making leave, not be able to keep going. But I ask you, Lord, for help for her, God, that this would not work anymore, that the power of God would take care of this need because of your promise to supply our need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Supply this need this morning by the glory of God, the power of God. Supply this need, Jesus. Supply this need. Supply this need. Come on, everybody. Tell him, ask him. Supply this need. Supply this need. Supply it, Lord. Supply it, Lord. She's got to have your help. She's got up by faith and come here and play the piano and sing by faith, Lord. And she's got to have her need. Supply it. Supply it. Supply it. Supply it. Supply it. Thank you, Lord, for supplying her name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for supplying it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. For every one of y'all being here, it's been it's wonderful this morning to be together with you. It's wonderful this morning to be together with y'all. Hallelujah, y'all of y'all. Wherever you are, praise God for us being together with you. Second Peter 1 and 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Sister Taylor, we pray for the message. Lord, we thank you for this day and we thank you for this church. Please help and guide Sister Linda as she brings the message to us today. Bless his Father. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. We don't really think about how much of our uh, lives are uh, under the influence of fear. But I'm telling you, I believe the Lord has given me this scripture because a lot of people are fearful. And sometimes you don't even know what you're fearful of. You just feel fear. You just aren't sure that, that uh, it's going to work out all right. Or aren't sure that you're going to do right. Or aren't sure that uh, other people are going to be right. You know, or that, that something's not going to come upon you that's going to be too powerful for you. Or that something is influencing you that's too powerful for you. So this scripture that God has given us here, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear. He wanted, He gave it to us because 
he was talking to Timothy. Paul was talking to Timothy. And he called him his son in the Lord. And he said, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, or Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, for, for all that reason, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is what we have. You may be operating under the influence of a spirit of fear, but that's not God. That's not what God wants for you. He didn't give it to you when you first got saved, if you'll remember back. When you first got saved, remember back how free you felt. How uh, happy just to be with Jesus and Jesus to be with you. How great it felt to just be saved. All your sins are washed away and you're a new creature. You felt that peace. You felt that joy. And you felt that complete deliverance from everything that had you bound. Hallelujah. And there was not a spirit of fear there. Right. It was just liberty and just joy and just gladness that this had happened to you. Right. Hallelujah. And God did not give you that spirit of fear that's on. been on you maybe for the last month or year or two years or ten years. Yes. God did not give you that spirit of fear. That's that is right. not supposed to be yours. Right. It's right. not supposed to be something you walk around with. Come on. Amen. Oh! <laughs> Think about that. Think about that. Right. Hallelujah. God. That is something that you can let go of. In Jesus' name. You can let go of it. Praise God. He's not given you, for God has not given us, amen, all of us Christians. He's not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. Boy, I held on to that. When I first got saved, I had, my mind was not sound at all. But I held on to that. I held on to what he said there. Yes. That he's given me a spirit of a sound mind. Right. My mind is not crippled. My mind is not uh, under, under attack by the enemy. No more. Come on. It's not that way anymore. I've got a spirit of a sound mind. Right. Hallelujah. I've got a spirit of power. I've got a spirit of love. And I've got a spirit of a sound mind. Come That's on. what God has given me. Right. You old spirit of fear, you get out of this house. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Glory. Out, spirit of fear. We're not having you. You don't belong in here. God had not given it to us. And you got to leave in the name of Jesus. You can't be in here on any one of us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. He can just wait two seconds and he'll be back. <laughs> Why? Because he's used to dwelling there. Because we leave the door open a crack. All right. You want me to shut it this time? We get tell the spirit of fear to we get out. Him, we let him come back. I here. know. Get out, spirit of fear. We're not having you. And stay out. In the name of Jesus. Woo! Hallelujah. Woo! How many of you felt liberty when we were waving those claws? Waving those Kleenexes? Hallelujah. You felt liberty to love Him and worship Him and enjoy Him. Enjoy the Lord. He says the joy of the Lord is your strength. You can enjoy the Lord while you're waving the Kleenex. Hallelujah. Just trying to get His attention. Oh, you've been so good to me. Hallelujah. I feel joy unspeakable and full of glory. Hallelujah. In the enemy, I'll lay a spirit of fear on you. You're looking stupid. Right. This is silly. I surrender. <laughs> you know, there's a, that is a spirit of fear. What I'm doing is not supposed to be done. Come on. It's just Sister Linda's wanting to do something like that. I'm telling you, the spirit of fear, it'll creep up on you like you uh, you just don't even imagine that's what it is. But that's what it is. Right. Yes. Whew. Look at Acts chapter 10. Praise God. Amen. Acts chapter 10, God asked Amen. Peter to go do something. Amen. He showed him to go do something. What did he show him to go do? He showed him to go to, to the Gentiles' house. 
Peter ain't going to no Gentile's house. That wasn't allowed. But God had to show him but in a vision. In verse he was on the housetop. Let's read that. On the morrow as they went on their journey, Cornelius had sent people because the angel told him to go, to go and get Peter to show him things. And on the morrow as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. And saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending unto him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God hath cleansed that call not thou common. And the voice spake, Hallelujah. This was done thrice and the vessel was received up again into heaven. Hallelujah. God had to show Peter that he didn't need to be afraid to go to Cornelius' house. Right. He had to show him he didn't need to be afraid. Has God, does God have to tell you you don't need to be afraid? Yes. You don't need to be afraid. Yes. You don't need to fear. You can trust him. If he shows you to do something, you can trust him. You don't have to be afraid to do it. And that's what he showed Peter. And then when they came from Cornelius' house and talked to Peter, he said, Behold, three men seek thee. Arise therefore and get thee down and go with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Don't you be afraid. You doubt nothing. You go with them. He did doubt. That doubting nothing is verse seven, he did doubt. That doubting nothing doubt is very anything. important. That's right. And the problem with doubting nothing is you fear. You're afraid to not doubt. <laughs> oh my. When the Holy Ghost starts getting on you, and the doubt, the doubt comes. Right. It's leaving the door open. Right. Hallelujah. That fear comes. Right. What if he gets on me and makes me jump like a frog? I don't want to look like a crazy person jumping around like a frog. <laughs> He's probably never said that to you. But I'm telling you, it could be anything to make you afraid. To make you afraid that the Holy Ghost is not going to help you, but He's going to hurt you. He's going to harm you. He's going to do something that well, it's going to make you feel silly or make you feel like you don't want to wish it never had happened. I'm telling you, the devil is that spirit of fear and God has not given you the spirit of fear. But of power and of love and a sound mind. When you feel that fear is seeping down into your mind and it begins to cause you to doubt, you need to pull yourself back up and say, wait a minute. Right. I know where that's coming from. Right. God had not given me that. That's the truth. God's given me a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Come on. Hallelujah. So Peter went to Cornelius' house. Hallelujah. Verse 25, and as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. And Peter took him up saying, Stand up, I myself also a man. And as he talked with him, he went in and found many that were come together. <coughs> Let me tell you something about this whole situation. Cornelius wasn't afraid. Cornelius had seen the angel. Right. <laughs> God knows how to help you not to be afraid. He knows how to help you to not doubt. He knows how to help you to realize something's happening. Something's happening this morning. Y'all right. feel it? Something's right. happening. Right. This is not just a regular service. Something's happening. Oh, but Sister Linda, so many services behind. Forget it. Something's happening this morning. We've been praying. We've been seeking God. God's going to move. He is moving. Right. Something's happening. Hallelujah. When y'all pray for me, when I, I couldn't stand up, I had thrown up so much this weekend that my back was out this morning. And I was standing there and felt like I couldn't keep standing, and then I couldn't sit. And when I came and sat back down, I started feeling things moving around, it felt like. You know, like you're trying to get comfortable, and someone put their hand on me, and as they prayed, the Lord put it back together, and I can stand up, and I'm not hurting. And I thank the Lord for it, because He healed me. And who was that that put their hand on them? Who was it? Say, sister. <laughs> Say. Thank you, sister. It was the one the devil's been trying to tell ain't no good in the Lord. 
He's been oppressing her and depressing her with this fearful spirit. And I will tell you something. God knew. Hallelujah. Who it was that put his hand, her hand on her. It was Sister Pam. Hallelujah. He's not giving us that spirit of fear. It's not of the Lord. It's of the devil. And you need to tell him to get in the name of Jesus. Sister, believe it. Believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. He did. He did. Hallelujah. He put it back. Yes. I know who did it. I did it. Who glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory. 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 Hallelujah. Isn't that just like the wonderful Lord we serve? Yes, amen. Hallelujah. It's just like Him. He's what He is. He wants you to know I have not given you that spirit right. of fear. But I gave you a spirit of power Come and on. of love and of a sound mind. Right. It's not sound to be afraid of everything while well, you turn. Come on. Every, everything that happens, all of a sudden a fear grips your heart. No, that is not a sound mind. That is a scared mind. A scared spirit. Come on. And God doesn't want it on you. He wants you to understand. Hallelujah. He told Gideon, I taught y'all this Wednesday night. He told Gideon, Gideon, there was a lot of words about fear in that portion of Scripture that I read. Gideon was afraid a lot of times. But God said, fear not. Fear thou not, he said. Fear thou not. Jesus often went to his disciples when he walked on the water building and he said, Don't be afraid, it is I. Oh, Sister Linda, you ought to be afraid of speaking like that over the microphone to all these people. No, I should not. I have got a spirit of love and a power and a sound mind. Hallelujah. I'm not crazy. Oh no, I know what crazy is and I'm not it. Come on. I'm full of the Holy Ghost. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Amen. Whoa. Hallelujah. Glory. Who he said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds. This is a stronghold that's been up over our church. Come on. And I've had it with it. In the name of Jesus, yes. it's got to We go. told you to get out. In the name of Jesus. We're going to tell you one more time. In the name of Jesus, whoever you're upon in here, you get out. In Jesus' name, you spirit of fear, you get out. Stay out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on now. You're going to begin to feel better right now. Right. It's going to begin to feel like it's what's supposed right. to when you're a Christian. Joy unspeakable and full of glory right. and the half has never yet been told. Right. Sister Daddy, you pulled it out of there, didn't you? She pulled it out of that uh, songbook. Right. She gave it to us. Right. Should you have a spirit of fear on you, Dada? I don't think so. Not when God's showing you to pull a song out of there that he needed you to sing. Come on. Come on. You see God every day, Brother David, showing you things, don't you? Amen. Every day giving you uh, uh, anointed things, giving you a scripture, the whole Bible, and you open the Bible and it's one scripture you need. Right. How did he do that? I don't care how he did it. He did right. it. Amen. That's that spirit of love. His love. Yeah. Of power and of a sound mind. He's going to keep you right there. You're not going crazy, Sister Ashley. No. no. Oh, no. You're getting saner. You're getting Come saner, on. honey. Come on. You're getting saner. You've got a sound mind, honey. Come on. You've got a sound mind. You've got a spirit of love and Amen. of power and a sound mind. Amen. The Holy Ghost, right? The Holy Ghost. He's a liar. Woo! And he wants to make us afraid. And you don't have to be afraid. Right. Never. Because God's not giving us that spirit of fear. He's given it. He said, get out now. Right. In the name. Jesus' name. Get out. You don't have it. No, you don't. Right. You go ahead with the Lord. Joy unspeakable. Yes, amen. And full of glory. And the half has never been told. Hallelujah. There have no temptation taken you 
but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Yes, he's done it. Every Beloved time. Father. Beloved God. Yes. Beloved Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I was tempted to fear. Come on. <laughs> But it didn't get me. I took the way to escape. What was the way to escape? We were singing joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the half has never yet been told. I took that way. Some people say way of escape there. But yes, there can be a way of escape. But God wanted to point you to it. You know, it may be a hidden thing, the way of escape. But when God points you to it and say, honey... That's the way to escape. This message is the way to escape. That's the way to escape. You memorize, but God hath not given you, given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Take it. Take it. It's yours. Where is it found, Sister Linda? First, uh, 2 Timothy 1 and 7. 2 Timothy 1 and 7. It's your message. It's your word. It's your power. When Peter went to them, hallelujah, to Cornelius' house, Cornelius was not afraid. Cornelius wanted to know what God wanted him to know. Because the angel had come and told him to send for Peter. And he sent for Peter, and Peter came in the house and began to preach Jesus to him. He didn't know about Jesus, not really. He might have heard that he was crucified. He might have heard about him. Because he was at... And uh, Caesarea, he might have heard all of that. He might have known all about that. But he had never had him preached. He said, of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. You need to listen to that. He'll fill Sister Linda with the Holy Ghost, but he won't fill me. Something's wrong with me. You're being attacked by the enemy. You're being assaulted by a spirit of fear. And you've got to come away from that spirit of fear and leave it behind. Leave it in your, your dust as you go. I'm not afraid. Hallelujah. God is no respecter of persons. Listen, that's when He began to get a hold of us Gentiles. And He began to give us what the Jews had. I'm a Gentile, are you? Yes, yes we are Gentiles. And this is when God began to fill the Gentiles with their salvation and fill them with the Holy Ghost and fire. He said, I, the word I say, you know, that was published throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And we are witnesses of all things which he did both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Oh. Hmm. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Yes. Fear thou not. Fear thou not. Fear thou not. He is not a respecter of persons. If he filled me, he'll fill you. He'll do it. He'll do it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're tired of this spirit of fear hindering us. We are believing God. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Hallelujah. I have seen some of you with the Spirit of God all over you. 
And then it would be just kind of like, you back off or something. I don't know what happens. I don't know. I asked God, what's wrong? What's going on? And he gave me this scripture. But you also have to believe, not just against the spirit of fear. You also have to believe that he's given you the spirit of power. Yes. You know, when I preached Wednesday night about Gideon, he's afraid a lot. But God took him by the hand and made him a man, a mighty man of valor, didn't he? Amen. He created that man of valor in Gideon by taking him by the hand. And when you begin to feel the Holy Ghost moving on you, you get him in your hand. You say, Lord, I, this is when I need your hand in mine because I'm going to pray on through. I'm going to go on through to the power of the Holy Ghost through this power that you've given me. The spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. I'm going to love you right through it, Lord. Right through this trying to pull me away from what you got, what you got for me. And we'll love right through it. Hallelujah. Oh, my sound mind's got a hold of you, Father. He ain't letting go. My sound mind's got a hold of him this morning. If he can shout me all over the place in joy unspeakable and full of glory, he can help me to preach this message so it'll make a difference with you. Come on. Hallelujah. I'm nothing. But God said He's not a respecter of persons. He can throw the Word of God in me and give it to you through me. And it can bless your heart, make you what you need to be through His precious Word. Yes. He's not giving you that spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. Well, when Peter got through preaching that message, he said, well, oh, he didn't get through. While Peter yet spake, these words. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost and they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that they should not be baptized which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. So he stayed there with them. All of them full of the Holy Ghost. I don't blame him. Right. I stayed there too. When the Holy Ghost falls in this church and gets a hold of everybody in here, I don't think we're going to just say let's go home. Come on. I don't think so. We're going to let you have your liberty. Let the Holy Ghost speak and speak and speak. Hallelujah. The other night I was talking to a really wonderful Christian lady. And we were having us a good time. <laughs> we were letting the Holy Ghost have His way. And we were just enjoying over the phone. Never had met each other face to face. We were just letting each other have you know, the liberty to let the Holy Ghost have His way. All of a sudden, the Holy Ghost gave out a message through her to me. And she, gave, she interpreted the message. It was wonderful. It helped me. And then she told me, I've never done that before. She served the Lord for 50 years. I've never done that before. Come on. Maybe more than 50. I don't know. I know at least 50. Never done that before. God is pouring out His Spirit. God is moving. And that spirit of fear, you must not allow to hinder you anymore. When you feel it and you recognize what it is. You know, it might be just, I don't want to be foolish. I don't want to get in the flesh. Any, any kind of fear of doing Something where you can't go on with the Spirit. Anything like that. That's that spirit of fear. And you need to just say, God's not given me that. He gave me a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Hallelujah. I'm going to stop right there.
One day God spoke to me, I had it on this little green paper because I've been saving it. He said, I'll give you my strength to go on. Go on, Sister Yvonne. He's giving you strength. You know, this is something the devil will also do. He'll make you ashamed of being afraid. <laughs> oh, he's a mean thing, ain't he? He's a mean thing. He'll try to give you that spirit of fear, and then he'll try to make you ashamed of being afraid. There ain't no limits. He no limits to what he'll try. But there is a limit to the power he has. And you are the limit. You are the one that has to stand up and say, I'll shout. If I've got something to shout about, I'll shout. If I've got something to praise God about, I'll praise. If I've got something to worship the Lord about, I'll worship. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm letting that fear go today. Because it's not of God. It's not of God. Hallelujah. It's not of God. Is there anybody else that you'd like to come here and lay your fear on the altar? Hallelujah. Lay it on the altar. Say, God, I believe it. I believe just how she preached it.
Who prays God for victory in Jesus? Thank you for victory in Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. The answer, if you're struggling with it right now and you don't really know how to get loose from it, you're struggling with some fear right now and you don't know how to get loose from it is to plead the blood of Christ over it. I plead the blood of Christ over you spirit of fear. You will leave because the blood of Christ is upon me for deliverance. Plead your blood, Jesus. Plead your blood. I claim victory in Jesus. Oh, praise God. If he's still brought bugging you, troubling you, making you afraid, just say, I plead the blood of Christ. Because I've not been given the spirit of fear, but a power of love. Hallelujah, Jesus. will be in force in each of our lives. In force. Right? In force. In force. Where it actually is what is happening in our lives. Come on, Nehemiah, Nehemiah. Tonight, Lord. 